Sometimes we don't represent precisely that which God wants us to represent, but eventually God will help us to come there because in, in fact, God is in control. And since God is in control of who we are and what we are about, we can depend upon him to get it right. Things happen in our lives. Things happen uh, here on earth. And sometimes we come to a place where we have to recognize that change comes. And when change comes, we need to adapt to the change. Now, I know that many of you studied the uh, uh, thought of evolution in, uh, when you were coming up, that we evolve. Well, I don't believe in evolution to the extent that I came from the bacteria of the sea. I don't believe that. I don't believe that I once was a fossil. I don't believe that. I believe the Bible's writ that says that uh, God created. I believe in the creation. And so evolution, to the extent that Darwin taught it, I don't believe it, but creation as described by Moses in his writ, I do believe that. But I do know that there have been some adjustments. I do know that there have been some changes. There have been changes in the way we act, changes in the way we talk, changes in the things that we do. And environmentally, there are situations which have caused the change. So when we look at change, sometimes change has to come. I think about the period of the Renaissance in Italy. In Italy, there was the Renaissance, and someone may ask the question, what is the Renaissance? The Renaissance is the humanistic revival of classical art, architecture, literature, and learning that originated. And this happened in Italy. Uh, the f fifth uh, century uh, up to and through the 14th century, we had what we call the medieval period. And the medieval period uh, was a time where they addressed themselves to things that are primitive, things that were antiquated, archaic, old fashioned and out of date. And as I said, it was from the fifth through the 14th century. Those things that they had at that time were good. Those things that they had at that time were good for that time, but they were not lasting because they could not endure the change of time. And so the Renaissance period came uh, during uh, the 14th and the 16th uh, century and modern art architecture, things that we do today, uh, we do them because of what happened through the period of the Renaissance. We do understand that some of the most powerful art work that came forth that we look at today uh, came through that period. Most of us know about Leonardo da Vinci and the Mona Lisa. We know about Michelangelo and the sculpture of David. We know about Raphael and the school of the Athens. We know about William Shakespeare with Hamlet, Romeo, and Juliet. Uh, those things came into focus because there was a need for change. And these people with their history and creativity and innovativeness were able to bring these things back out. And these things do exist today. They exist today because of the fact that we have taken them and we have made things from them sort of like the Bible. There are things that we do in the United States of America with our constitution that we receive from the Bible. If it were not for the Bible, some of those things would not have been mentioned within our Constitution. But our Constitution continues today because it, it 
took a lot of that which was in terms of substance and built thereupon. The people of the Renaissance took a lot of that which was of substance and they built thereupon. The point that I'm getting to is when you need to be rebuilt, sometimes we're not actually talking about, and most of the time, a physiological change. Because sometimes you don't need a physiological change, you need a psychological change that can help you so that you can do what needs to be done. But the real problem that we have today with the psychological change is that we don't understand all the damage that has been done to us psychologically. Uh, we have things that have happened into our lives. And some of you looking at me, you know you've undergone some things in your early childhood that you're trying to rid yourself from, but absent of the very presence of the Lord, you're unable to do it. And you go to your psychiatrist, you go to your psychologist, you go to your psychoanalyst, and they talk to you about these problems that you had coming up. But the, all they can do is tell you what happened. They can, after you've told them what happened, and they tell you what might be uh, uh, an answer and a solution to the problem. But the truth of the matter is that those things that are so damaging psychologically uh, can be cured through a source. And the source that can be cured through is that of your spirit. Yeah, the spirit person, who you are spiritually, has to be changed and not just who you are psychologically because you can fill your head with a whole lot of knowledge and the damage that was done when you were young is yet there because it penetrated your spirit person and you need to have something done with regard to your spirit person to cause you to be who God wants you to be. But the thing that I love God about, he does not leave us where we are. The children of Israel had some psychological damage as well as spiritual damage. And what caused them to have that was that they integrated themselves. Now watch this. Color has never been a problem of integration. Nobody has a problem with integrating. I'm talking about in the Bible as it relates to color. What happens to us, the damage that they had in the Bible was whose God they would serve. Yeah, Moses, Moses married an Ethiopian woman, all right, and Moses was not Ethiopian. And so we're not dealing with color. We're dealing with spirit. We're dealing with, we're dealing with uh, 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 the mentality of person. What is your thought process? And then in this particular case, we're also dealing with religion and what God you serve. Well, it seems to me that if we're going to address ourselves to the God that we serve, that we ought to know if we believe there is but one God, then God made man. I'm going to say it again because I don't think you got it. I said, if we believe that there is one God, then God made man. So if there's one God that made man, who is the man that God made? The man that God made is consistent with everybody who is yeah and then, uh -huh, uh -huh. when he made man out of the man that he made everybody comes now whether you permanently tanned or not it does not matter you can be chocolate you can be vanilla it does not matter what does matter is whether or not you understand who you are and whether or not you understand where you come from. What is the origin of your life? And so we have to bring ourselves to a point where we don't fixate on those things which have been so damaging, but we look beyond them. But in order to look beyond them, we need some help because we can't get there by ourselves. I'm coming back to that. The children of Israel were chosen of God. It was a promise that he made to Abraham. Some people said it was because the, uh, the Hebrews were few in number. That may have been a thought, 
but it wasn't just because they were few in number. It's because God made a covenant with Abraham that he would bless his seed. And he has done just that as we can see quite clearly. Uh, and so God blessed them uh, and they were in Egypt because he told, he told Abraham that they would go to Egypt, they would be there 400 years. And he sent Moses and brought them out of Egypt across the Red Sea through the wilderness and over the Jordan around the walls of Jericho and the collapsing of those walls and they entered in and occupied and they received the promised land that he told them that they would receive. But in the midst of their enjoying, they integrated with persons who didn't believe in the God that they served. And in their walk of disobedience, they involved themselves in an arena with which they were not familiar because they were not familiar with being without God. I'm going to tell you church folk, when you come into Christ and you're dependent upon him, the world is not something that you enjoy, although it appears that you do. And the reason why I'm saying it, because you are unaccustomed to what's going on and you are dependent upon the Lord. And when you become dependent upon the Lord, you have a real problem trying to be dependent upon yourself. And so they were out there. They could not sing the way they used to sing. They, 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 there was not a praise for them as it had been. And so they were, they were scattered in different places. And then you had, you had your northern kingdom and your southern kingdom. I'm talking about tribes of Israel. And they were in different places doing different things. Something happens when we become divided. Something happens when a church becomes divided. When there are certain people who believe a certain way and others who believe yet another way. And we all don't come together on the principles that God gives to us. And we have a tendency to stand off. And we stand off because we don't feel included. And I know some of the greatest hurt that any of us have is in the church. I said some of the greatest hurt is in the church. By sanctified, Holy Ghost feel, fire baptized, hand clapping, foot stomping, tongue speaking people in the church. It hurts when you know you love God, but people treat you like you don't because you don't walk like they walk. You don't talk like they talk. Children of Israel were in these places and they were not able to do. And then when they wanted to do, some of the leadership would not allow them to do. How many know that sometimes leaders would take us off in a direction where we ought not be and have us doing what is, is, is uh, preconceived and thought of being worship when it really is not? And you're not accustomed to that. And you feel a sense of bondage. You feel, you feel that, that that which you know you should be experiencing, you don't. And what you want to happen in your life does not. And then you hear about all the things that are said to you about what will happen. And you sit back waiting for those things to happen. But seem like they don't. You're like... Um, Bishop, Mr. Clean, Richard White. You've been waiting for a miracle and it seemed like it just won't come. And I know I'm looking at some people right now who are looking at things as far as church is concerned and it seemed like it just is not where it's supposed to be. There's nothing wrong with the church that Jesus established. There's nothing wrong with the God of the Bible. 
there is nothing wrong with the discipline that God has given to us. But there is something wrong with those of us who are not adherents to his word. The problem is not the Bible. The problem is not God. The problem is not the church. The problem is that there are people who are not adherents, people who are not followers of the word of God and settled in the discipline of God. Therefore, the will of God cannot be done on a regular basis because we hinder it. And it cannot be your history that causes you to feel that you're not where you're supposed to be. Because you're not the only person who was hurt when you were a child. You're not the only person that somebody lied to. You're not the only person somebody cheated on. You're not the only person who lost what you had. You're not the only person who's down in your so-called luck. I don't believe in luck, but you're not the only person who's down in it. You're not the only person who people didn't forgive. You're not the only person where the light shone upon your ineptitude. You're not the only person who's gone through trial and tribulation and testing time. Others have gone through it, but they made it. God is saying to the children of Israel in the first verse because they've been away from him. They were his, but there was an absentia of ownership. And so he says in that first verse, God owns again all of Israel. He is the God of all families and people. You've been away, but I want you to know that I'm the God of all families of Israel, and they are my people. That's the beginning. That's the beginning of being built Again, the acknowledgement that God owns you to the extent that he's willing to invest in you to make you better. Woo. You see, I know you're sitting there looking, but I'm going to tell you, when you're going through the testing of your times, you need to know that God yet owns. Because when he says that, your deliverance is his responsibility. It's not just yours, but it's his responsibility. In other words, he takes upon himself whatever is needed to bring you out. In the second verse, he says to the Israelis, he says, I want you to know who I am and what I'm about because this is not just something new. He said, the Israelis found, he said, the Israelis found grace in the wilderness. And irrespective of the sword, they found grace. They could have been killed in the wilderness. But instead of being killed, I gave them my grace. You see, sometimes you belly ache over what you don't have and you ought to thank God for what you do have. You complain of your predicament, but you need to stop complaining and thank God that in the midst of your trial, in the midst of your turbulence, he was there and gave you grace. And his grace is sufficient. He says, 
there were enough things going on. The sword was there. But I didn't let you get killed by it. There are things that you involved yourself in that should have taken you out of here. But he didn't let it take you out of here. And the reason is that he wants to rebuild you. Yeah, 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 yeah. He wanted to rebuild. He wanted to build you over again. And in the third verse, the Lord reminds Jeremiah that he loved Israel with, watch, watch, an everlasting love. Now, most of you humans don't love everlastingly. Because as soon as I do something you don't like, you stop loving me. Oh, I know what I'm talking about. When you hear that I said something about you that you don't think I should have said, you stop, lo you stop loving me. I'm going around the corner. Please hold on. I hope you have your seat belts on. When your significant other, when your wife or husband has done something that you consider to be immoral and they've been with somebody else, you don't want to enter into a forgiving posture. The first thing you do is say by the word, if it be for fornication, I can get rid of you. But you could say by that same word, if it's for love on the part of me loving you and you loving me, we can make this work. I know I'd lose you. I know I'd lose you. I know I would lose you. I know I would lose you. But that's the kind of God we serve. When you go out, the Bible, excuse me, excuse me. I'm going to use the W-H-O-R. Uh -huh, I'm going to use that. And, and, and you young people, please know that I'm not cussing. I'm using the word that's in the Bible. The Bible says that they went a whoring after other gods. He said, but I love you with an everlasting love. If we could ever bring ourselves to, to really getting into the agape and not the, the amorous and the filial, but if we can get into the agape, if we get into the agape, then we can love people like we should, irrespective as to whether or not they love us back. Yeah, your feelings are going to get hurt. Yes, you're going to get embarrassed. But there's no embarrassment and no feelings hurt that God cannot help you with. He's a God that heals. So he said with loving kindness. Have I drawn thee? The fourth verse, and that's the verse of record for us. Again, I will build thee, and thou shalt be built. I did it once, but I'm going to do it again. I did it once, but I'm going to do it again. Don't ever feel that you've entered into any place where God cannot do it again. Don't ever feel that you enter into a place where restoration is not possible. Don't ever feel that you enter into a place where you cannot have yourself. God will build you again. And he said, you shall be built. I'm, he, he's not going to, listen to me. He's not going to treat us like some of these rehab houses that they do. 
they look good with ornamentation and all that kind of stuff. But he said, I'm not going to do you like that. I'm going to start from inside and work out. Praise God. I'm a, yeah, you may have a broken arm, but I'm not going to heal your arm in me, but I am going to heal your soul. You may have it. I'm going to lift your spirit. I'm going to bring you up to a place where you can enjoy life, whether you have everything or not. Because where you are now, over there in those other places, I'm going to bring you back. He says, I'm going to speak. To, to the people. I've already started restoring in the northern kingdom. I'm going to restore in the southern kingdom and all the people of Israel will be my people and they're going to go forth in the dances of them that make merry. Yeah. They're not going to dance just because it's perfunctory. They're going to dance because they're going to dance with the people who make merry. Sometimes some of us want to dance because we want to dance. But you ought to dance with the people who are making merry because of the goodness of God and what God is doing in life. Before I came in here, I asked God, Lord, you have to help me because my voice is not, not there. I know what's going on. I'm not sick. I'm not in pain. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. But I got this. What have I got? You ain't going to give me something I don't want. <laughs> he was just trying to be helpful, just trying to be helpful. Just trying to be helpful, but I'm not taking whatever that is. He said, laryngite, I'm not taking that. Uh, Let me read. Oh, my goodness. At least give me a, just a couple more minutes. Thank you. He said, Behold, I will bring them from the north country and gather them from the coast of the earth. And with them, the blind and the lame, the woman with child and her that travaileth with child together, a great company shall return thither. Now, I want to say this. I'm just going by what the Bible says. I don't know what happened here. I don't know if it's a misprint or what. But notice he says he's going to gather them from the north and the country, and he's going to bring them. Then he talked about a woman with child and one that's travailing. I don't know, didn't say nothing about their husbands. Lord, I'm losing them again, Lord. I'm losing them again. He didn't say a word about their husbands. He said, the woman with child and the one that travaileth. Am I right? The point I'm saying is, when God starts bringing people into the church, he's going to bring some folk in here who are not married, but they, they're pregnant. They have children. But he's going to bring them in. What are we going to do when they come in? I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you what he wants us to do. He wants us to love them and give them some guidance and help them. Listen to me. I want you to hear what I'm saying and help them so that they don't do it over again. But the only way that that can happen is if we are rebuilt or build a game so that we can understand what we need to do to help those who don't know what to do. So would you believe, you believe that these young girls ought to get pregnant? No, I don't believe they ought to get pregnant. But I'm saying if they do, they ought to have a house called church that they're welcome to come to so that we can help build their lives. Now,
Not only that, but all these other folk who are going through whatever they're going through, the church ought to be filled with people of passion, of love, and of mercy, and of understanding. Not to go along with wrong, but to help the wrong to get right. If they can't get in any other place, you all be able to get in the church. But some of us have been going through some stuff ourselves until we don't have enough ourselves to help anybody else. You're still painting. You're yet frustrated. You yet feel downtrodden. You yet feel some sense of hopelessness. You are yet needing some help. And so you come to church and you don't feel like being bothered although you come. And you don't want to praise. And you don't want to lift up the name of the Lord. And you get tired of standing while the people are praising. And you get upset because the message is about 10 minutes longer than what you think it ought to be. And you having a problem with the prayer because they pray too long. And you having a problem with the person who sits next to you. I'm going to tell you, God sees all of us. And in the year 2019, he's saying, again, I will build you and you shall be built because I'm going to take all the negativity out of your life and I'm going to fill your heart with joy and peace and love we need some better lives I said we need some better lives but the only way better lives will come if God builds them I'm just about not quite but I'm just about through. I need God to build me. I don't need you to build me. Because I'm looking at you. And you don't look that well yourself. And so I don't need you to build me. I need God to build me. I need God to change me. He's the one that created man in the beginning the way man's supposed to be and since he knows and he has the pattern and he knows what's needed I need him to build me I need him because he knows what's wrong with me you don't know what's wrong with me you think I you 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 think you think I'm going you think that I'm not standing because of my uh, feet hurt my, no, no that's not the reason I'm not standing I'm not standing because I just don't want to be bothered and when you come in and you sit next to me I don't say anything but I really didn't want you to sit by me uh, and he, he knows that he knows that I'm having a problem with you sitting by me but I'm not going to tell you that you are my problem I'm just going to sit there and not praise the Lord somebody going to hear what I have to say I'm not going to tell you all of my history because you won't forgive me if I tell you all of my history and the things that I have done in my life and the decisions that I have made in my life you won't forgive me so I don't need you to build me I need God to build me I need God to get inside of me and do what's necessary for me They used to say, search me, Lord. Search me. And then they used the word if. Well, I'm not going to use the word if. I'm going to use the word when. When you find anything that shouldn't be, take it out and strengthen me. I want to be right. I want to be holy. And so, the last point that I'm saying, God, 
since you said, again, you would build us, I'm just telling you, Lord, build me. Build me from my head down to my toes. Build me one more time. Give me one more chance. Give me one more opportunity. Build me again. Build me again. Build me again. If you got anything out of this message, give God some praise. Hallelujah. As we look to God, as we're in 2019, whatever the impairments were in 2018, whatever caused you to slack up, Whatever caused you to look at people differently than what you should. Whatever created the problem for you. Caused you to act in a way that you know that's not you. I want you to know that God will fix it. He'll cause your life to be better. But he'll start on the inside and work in your spirit person. And have his word penetrate deeply into your spirit that it will flow out of your spirit into your mind. And once your mind or your soul and your spirit form a union, your body is going to walk in accordance with what they do. If you're in here today and you know you need some help. You don't want 2019 to be like 2018, but you want something different, something better. Not what Jerry Maynard sees or anybody next to you sees, but what God sees and what God desires. If you want to change, you want your life to be built better. Your hands are not going to look new. Your feet are not going to look new, but your attitude. Brothers, I'm doing this a little different way. Amen. Brothers, I'm doing this a little different way. Thank you. I appreciate you, but I'm doing it a little different way. I think you all think that I'm trying to get somebody to come. I'm trying to get people who are born again believers who need to be rebuilt. The disciples did not sin, but what they did, they had a struggle with those persons who didn't believe in the Jesus that they served. And they beat them, incarcerated them, but they went again into the upper room, not the one where they were before. And the Bible says they were filled with the Holy Ghost, not baptized, but filled. Because they needed a refreshing. Sometimes we need a refreshing that builds us over again. If you're in here looking at me, I want you to make your way down here if you want God to do something for you in this year, 2019, that will cause you to be different in attitude, in behavior, in spirituality, in commitment to Him, and in passion. Just come. Hallelujah. 
is called. God bless. I speak to Satan now. And I tell him he has been active in your lives much too long. And because of that, I cast him out in the name of Jesus. And Satan, you have no place in their lives, in their thoughts. You are cast out and we speak spiritual freedom, deliverance in the name of Jesus. And it is so. You all are standing here projecting the thought of God doing something great in your life. And I want to tell you today, he is doing just that. You don't see it, but God is doing it. You won't leave here like you came. In Jesus' name. You will not leave here like you came. This is the day and the moment of your deliverance. Who you are will be different than who you were when you first walked in this house. I see God building character. I see God building homes. I see God building lives. I see God doing miraculous things within your life. You've been waiting for a while for this to happen. God says it is now. I said, God said, it is now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Since you are standing and you believe, you wouldn't have come up here if you didn't believe. We take ownership of the change and new birth, rebuilding. We take ownership of it and we do so by faith. And so by faith right now, all on this altar, 
I want you to thank God for your new life. Thank God for your new life. Let, let, let the music cease for a moment. But I don't, I don't think some of you heard that I said we're thanking God for new life. New life. Come on. We're thanking God for new life. New life. New life. Not the same, not the way it has been, not what the devil wants it to be, but a new life. We give him praise. Woo. Hallelujah. We give him praise for a new life. As you go back to your seat, know that you're free. Come on. No more. a blessing yeah. praise the Lord hallelujah I'm free somebody say I am free oh praise the Lord I'm free and I'm no longer bound no more chains holding me my soul it's such a blessing Somebody praise the Lord Hallelujah, I'm free Hallelujah Hallelujah Oh, glory, glory, glory Hallelujah, hallelujah Hallelujah Thank God I'm free Free in Jesus Whom the sun sets free it's truly free indeed. Oh, I'm free. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. Glory, glory, glory. While, while you're yet standing, while you're yet standing, there are three areas of which I am speaking now. And I want you to respond, those of you who will. If you're in the house today and Jesus is not your Lord, I want you to allow him to come into your life today. If you're in the house today and Jesus is your Lord and you've been searching for a church home, I offer a cathedral of praise today. Thirdly, if you're in the house today and you were once here, but for whatever reason, you left, we want you to know with open arms, we welcome you back. 
in those three areas, if you're in here and you want to come, just meet me here in the front. Just come from your, from your pew area. Amen. And let God have his way in your life for 2019. What a great way it is to start off 2019. And I stand and I wait for you. And to the end that we're free, give God praise. All right. God bless you. Amen. There will not be service tonight. Pardon me. I'm trying to see what you want. What a great witness that she's 92. God bless your mother. We're excited about you. You're on your way. Now, Sister Buchanan, pardon me, your name is Buchanan, am I right? All right, Sister Buchanan, next year when she's 93, just say it out loud, don't, don't be so bad, folks. All right. That, that's not a problem. Amen, that's not a problem. Amen. Mother, so I'm gonna give you I'm gonna give you a dollar for each year. That's ninety-two and then and then I'm gonna give you I'm gonna give you I'm gonna give you a dollar for each year, not right now, because I don't I don't have it and change in my pocket. Last time I looked, I had about 60 in my pocket, but I'm going to give you a dollar for each year plus eight. So that'll be $100 I'm going to give to you. Amen. We're glad that you made it. Now, I tell you what, since Sister Buchanan is your armor bearer, you can have Sister Buchanan to come to my office today at the service. And I'll give it to her and she'll give it to you. Oh. See, my wife always is supportive of what I do, and she wanted to make sure I did it now. And there's your one hundred dollars. God bless you. See, brothers. That's the reason why it's good to have a good wife. Amen. They won't leave you hanging. She want to make sure that, that she got it. And then you all could witness me giving it. Amen. So thank you. Thank you. Now... When I get to the office, I'll give it back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, okay. I'm not going to tell that part. I'm gonna, 
I'm going to keep that part to myself. Some things you have to keep to yourself. Some things. Well, we're going to worship God in the ministry of giving.